Okay, this is part two of week 12's lecture. Um, we're going to begin with the southern map, and this is a map that we have looked at in the previous lecture, and we've associated the map with the mercantile Chinese community of Southeast Asia. And, and, and part of recognizing the visible presence of uh, the Chinese community in Southeast Asia is uh, not just acknowledged through their trade presence, but also a history of their persecution in, uh, in, in two contexts that I've suggested. So in previous lectures, I've suggested that in both Batavia and in Manila, the Chinese were viewed as both indispensable uh, to colonial trade, to the running of these port cities, while at the same time also viewed with equal measure of suspicion, uh, often resulting in historical massacres at a scale uh, that was meant to assert uh, certain forms of control over this population that European colonial settlers often thought of as unruly, as unmanageable on a certain level. And part of this unmanageability really stems from uh, a, a system of self-organization that Chinese sojourners uh, who left uh, coastal China uh, to seek their fortunes in different parts of the world managed to develop. And these are the Gongsis or the Gongsi. And, and Gongsis today uh, take on the meaning of a company or, or if transliterated as Gongsi, it would be a system that manages labor, uh, a labor force, for example. But in its earliest usage, it is really a type of cooperative where each participating member uh, uh, thought of, was often thought of to have uh, democratic part, stake within the running of these Kongsis. So Kongsis are structured as initiatory brotherhoods. Uh, uh, in the earlier times, they were also known as secret societies, and they have initiation ceremonies, and built into these initiation ceremonies are uh, myths, legends, and historical memory, uh, often uh, giving some sense of moral purpose uh, to the initiated member of the Gongsi. It often does is to give meaning to the life of an ordinary person who has left one's hometown uh, in order to seek one's fortune overseas. And these stories aim to embolden and edify and give their life a certain sense of purpose rooted in a mythological understanding of uh, their environment. Um, so some of the uh, uh, records of this has been uh, has survived in the form of, uh, for example, this map of all the initiatory chants uh, that give you a sense of the architectural quality of how space and ritual is imagined uh, uh, during a ritual ceremony, for example. So while the initiation ritual might not uh, appear so elaborate, uh, there is that there's a ritual imagination that is uh, that that is uh, in contrast in terms of its proportion to how it's uh, being actualized in real life. Uh, rather, what we see here is a much richer kind of vocabulary, visual vocabulary being used to illustrate uh, uh, what is going on in the mental state of someone undergoing. That ritual process. So different concepts serve different purpose and for example uh, one of the oldest uh, uh, concepts uh, actually is centered on uh, the, the, the communication, the teaching and the mastery of certain knowledge. So one of the oldest type of guilds that uh, in existence in Southeast Asia uh, that's still around today is the Lupan uh, Guild, and these are the Guild of Carpenters, and you find them in Penang, uh, in Singapore. Over the course of the 19th, uh, late 18th century and early 19th century, they participated within a tripartite arrangement 
uh, in the building of many colonial port cities, especially in parts of Southeast Asia, where you have engineers uh, uh, being sent out from uh, you know, Europe uh, who would often carry with them certain uh, architectural manuals, uh, such as a treatise of civil architecture that you see here. And uh, these would have modular building forms uh, that our uh, engineers were uh, supposed to rely on and, and refer to in order to create buildings of a modular nature. If there were many public buildings or civic buildings uh, that seem similar across like the colonial uh, port city, it's also one of the reasons was because a lot of them uh, took reference or inspiration from these uh, architectural manuals. However, in order for, them, uh, for the engineers to actually build these structures, they needed the manpower. And manpower came in two forms. First, there was the hard laborer. Often these were the indentured laborers, uh, you know, uh, those who were con convicted of a crime and then were sent into exile. Many of them would be political dissidents. However, in serving their sentences abroad, they were also made to uh, undertake hard labor. And often this involved uh, the building of public works or a participation in uh, the creation of like, you know, uh, civic or government building, government sponsored projects. Uh, however, uh, beyond this are uh, a more specialized class of builders and these are builders who know how to source materials, who knows how to shape the materials. And this knowledge was often non-European. Uh, for example, in the Lubanzing, which is a really old treatise on how do you construct a building in the Chinese tradition, uh, this would uh, be a treatise that is closely connected to uh, uh, the, the Luban Guild uh, uh, of Carpenters. For example, in the Lupin Kilt itself, uh, in Penang, you would uh, find it on Love Lane, right? Uh, and it's very different from, for example, the Yin Zhao Fa Si, which is another type of treatise on how you construct certain, the bracketing system in Chinese uh, roof construction. Uh, for if the latter system tends to be more technical focus or scientific focus, the Lupan itself is a mixture of uh, rituals uh, as well as mythology and how uh, a, a carpenter uh, is also not only granted technical mastery or knowledge over woodwork, but is someone who is imbued with certain kind of power. In a sense, it's much more closer uh, in comparison to, for example, uh, a Masonic organization, Freemasonry. And Freemasonry is something that developed in the 18th century in Europe as a kind of like fraternity or a social brotherhood where people use uh, the terminologies connected to architecture and building uh, in order to, uh, as a metaphor for uh, individual's moral growth and spiritual growth. Uh, uh, so uh, there is a lot of similarities between how uh, a, a carpenter guild uh, would also um, carry within it a lot of like, sacred or secret symbols and use initiatory ritual as a way to regulate uh, knowledge and impart knowledge amongst its members. So in, part, in, in this sense, then, uh, what the Gongsis are, are is that it's really an exemplification of anarchism, of uh, a belief or a system of self-organizing. Uh, and we can connect this to examples that we've seen in our first part of our lecture, where communities that have escaped the long arm of the state or monarchies or the circle find new lines of flight and find striations and, and the capacity to negotiate uh, uh, 
some level of distance away from centers of power, sometimes even causing great anxiety and worry, uh, especially amongst those who uh, idea of power is not as absolute as they like to think it to be, especially monarchies and colonial settlers. Uh, so what does this have to tell us about you know, art history? I guess in many ways, when we write the history of art, uh, often art history is visualized within timelines. Uh, you know, the most detailed art history timeline uh, that's, that today that you can find is the Metropolitan Museum of Art's uh, Helbrun timeline, uh, which uh, is very rich and it has essays about art objects, lists of art periods, rulers, styles, and even the use of maps. Uh, of course, this is a very complex version. Most timelines are visualized as linear and progressive. They march through time uh, as a straight line, right? Uh, um, however, I think increasingly scholars are suggesting that we might have to rethink how we understand art history solely through uh, this type of very progressivist uh, way of plotting objects in relation to a linear time, principally because a lot of things would not fit into this march of time, and things that do not fit or do not fit nicely into it are then often ignored or left out of what we choose to focus on when we talk about what is important or what is valuable or what's important art about a particular culture. Uh, so uh, this is uh, an example of how we can uh, think of time as much more multidimensional. It's taken from a Netflix series now. And it looks at time. Uh, the black line at the center gives you the more linear time. But uh, outside of this, uh, you know, uh, because it's a show about you know, time travel, and how time travel affects change within uh, uh, our sense of uh, time as we know it, uh, as a linear sort of like uh, march towards the future. Uh, there are also all these other waves and curves uh, that brings about moments of change, uh, right? And so thinking about time in a much more creative way in a much more multi-dimensional way uh, will allow us to see new kinds of uh, uh, objects and bring new types of objects into, uh, into view. So, uh, for example, in a recent article by Wayan uh, Jara Sastrawan um, on the different types of temporality that one can find in historical Southeast Asian writing, he suggests that perhaps conventional models of historical time often assume timeline as something that is unidirectional or linear uh, in nature, and therefore every distinct moment is either prior or after another moment, and therefore simultaneous moments are self-identical. Outside of this, then, other theories exist that seems to create certain conceptual dichotomies uh, meaning that it's uh, seen as a binary, either between linear and cyclical time or empty versus full time. But what Wayan is suggesting is that Southeast Asian historical texts present a much richer and more complex set of temporalities, often within the same text itself. And he does this through looking and exploring at two uh, types of texts. Uh, one is the 17th century Malay dynastic genealogy, uh, called the Sejarah Melayu, uh, in today's uh, or the, the Malay his, uh, the Malay Annals, or, uh, and another text is the 18th century Javanese chronicle uh, called the Babat in Sankala uh, from Java. So on the basic basis on narrative, uh, uh, what Wayan is suggesting is that there are relationships between. Uh, moments uh, that can be explored uh, and mapped out uh, in a graphical form. And these are therefore a type of type topology or a landscape of the time. Uh, 
and these topologies express a set of structural relationships between different moments in a narrative. And from this topology itself, they can be visualized using graphs uh, to show how uh, beyond the linear concept of time that you see on the upper left corner and beyond the cyclical nature of time, there is also the genealogical concept of time and the four kind of like concept of time that you see below. Right? Analyzing how narrative devices generate historical temporalities uh, in many ways allow uh, Wayan to explore how temporal structures in these two historical texts uh, can teach us something about a theory of how time is understood. What this suggests is that the very instrument of state craft, right, of, of, of consolidating state power, is of themselves, uh, in fact, much more creative uh, and much more adaptive and fluid, uh, and in many ways similar to uh, the way history is understood uh, in Zomia. Uh, in, uh, if we want to sort of like bring this into a comparison. And in a way, this is a very nice way to end our lecture series because it's forcing us to think of the history that we are writing as our historians and as students interested in thinking about objects in relation to the past and how to understand objects of the past and make meaning out of them is that it is a process that requires us to really be much more imaginative and creative in the way we engage with an object's history. And this requires us to sometimes abandon, uh, cherish ideas of what we understand to be history, uh, uh, to explore other ways in which history can be written, and to discover a set of much more complex understanding of time, so that we can finally make sense of the diverse range of objects that we have um, encountered uh, even over the course of our study this semester uh, in order to uh, give it the kind of space that it deserves and, and recognize the kind of intelligence that goes into the making and the thinking uh, that objects can express to us, that can, uh, objects can share with us not just as stories, but also as, and not just as knowledge, but also as meaning and understanding and as very powerful forms of expression that sometimes escapes meaning itself. Okay, so um, that's it for this semester really. Um, I look forward to the next two uh, sessions where uh, you will be presenting your uh, portfolio uh, uh, essay, multimedia essay, as well as the last week where we reflect more broadly together on this question of writing art history or histori art historiography.